Back in November, Tom approached me about appearing on several episodes for the new season of the Cutting Room Movie Review Podcast, and it was an honor to be asked back. I can talk about films for hours. I've always had a good time busting balls with these gents. And then in January, when Tom approached me about writing an intro to one of the films we would be discussing, I, I was truly touched. I felt I had moved into the upper echelon of the cutting room. I was a VIP. I was getting a key to the executive washroom and a company car. Moreover, I was just excited to contribute. My, my mind was a world with what movies we would discuss. What would Tom assign to me? What movie would I get to analyze and deconstruct, attempting to find the inner meaning and significance? <laughs> like Ralphie from A Christmas Story running home to see if li his little orphan Annie decoder ring was waiting for him in his mailbox, I found myself hastening home to my laptop to see if I had received an email from Tom. What would our topic be? Perhaps, perhaps the movies of P.T. Anderson, my favorite living director? I mused as I <laughs> pictured us all discussing the deep, penetrating madness of rageful self-loathing portrayed magnificently in Punch Drunk Love. Uh, maybe we would cover the movies of Terry Gilliam where Max and I could propose and defend the notion that Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is the most important and significant motion picture in the history of motion pictures. <laughs> Furthermore, we would insist that the voting members of the Academy present both Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro an Apologia Award for Best Co-Actors Ever. Then, on a fateful day in mid-February, when I had all but given up hope I would ever receive another email from Tom, it arrived. I was giddy. Like Ralphie, I ran into my bathroom and locked the door behind me. I needed complete and unmolested <laughs> privacy to open this vital communique. I began to read one line at a time as the show topic slowly revealed itself to me. Don't forget to drink your opal tea. <laughs> I rubbed my eyes and I read again. The films of Ron Howard. <laughs> Just as Ralphie walked dejectedly from his bathroom, muttering to himself, seemingly questioning the very meaning of life, a, a, a stupid commercial, I could only do the same. A stupid commercial director, Ron Howard? I, I mean, he's okay, I guess, but he, is he a director truly worthy of a three-hour discussion? He's consistent, but he's consistently safe. Has, has he made his seminal movie? Will he? Can he? Will he provide the world with a singular work of art that would be remembered for generations? Has he made a difference? Okay, okay, sure. Yeah, Splash did provide me with a good deal of pubescent masturbatory material as my <laughs> hypersexual 12-year-old mind raced with perverted thoughts of what I would have done to Madison the Mermaid if I were Alan Bauer. And, uh, you know, I guess Apollo 13 was pretty cool. I like space shit as much as the next guy. But other than that, what have you got? Midgets running around with fairies, aliens that get old people horny, some movie with Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, and a horse, and a bastardization of a Dr. Seuss classic. But despite the fact that Ron Howard is not one of my more favorite directors, I decided to take the high road. No, Joe, not literally. Okay, a, a little literally. I was going to make the best of it. I continued to read Tom's email dispatch, strolling down to see which movie would be mine. Wait a minute. What? Could this be? Had, had I been duped? Was this some kind of sick joke? A beautiful mind? First Ron Howard, now Russell Crowe, perhaps my least favorite actor. Uh. Everything that is wrong with the Hollywood star system. A doughy, eating-eyed, <laughs> monosyllabic, mumbling, home-wrecking bad boy who phones in performances and somehow has been imbued with the power to make women's underwear spontaneously melt away at the mention of his name. The kind of self-involved, entitled, arrogant, celebrity dimwit that curses out waiters and thrashes hotel rooms. And mind you, with none of the class and charm exhibited by Johnny Depp when he used to thrash hotel rooms, that wow. was cool. But listen, guys, I get it. I'm the counselor. I work with people challenged with mental illness every day. It's only natural that you think of me to set up a movie <laughs> featuring a man with schizophrenia. It makes you know, perfect sense. So. I will set aside my own prejudices regarding the eternally twisted love affair between Ron Howard and Russell Crowe, and I'll give you guys what you want. So about 15 years ago, I had the pleasure of getting to know a young woman. She was a, a beautiful, beautiful head-turner, tan skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, and what's more, she was smart. I mean, like, brainy-ass smart. Funny, sweet, thoughtful, kind. All the people I've come to know in my lifetime, she's one of my favorites. And she also suffered from a delusional order. And she was a client of mine, and we worked closely together for about four years. And she struggled with her mental illness, and it led her to abusing drugs and even spending some time in the porn industry. But 
Despite these challenges, she managed to pull herself out of her addictions and her bad choices and was trying to turn her life around. However, her biggest obstacle was her family. They had never really believed that she was sick. To them, she was either lazy or jealous of her younger sister. She was impulsive. They believed she made bad choices to punish them, to embarrass them and their wealthy circle of friends. In their minds, they had lost her daughter. She was nothing more than an addict and a whore. So I tried to help them understand, uh, as I had come to understand her, as a truly beautiful, if not troubled soul. And then one day, after a meeting with the family and the psychiatrist, her father took me aside to tell me of a breakthrough he had recently experienced. He told me he had just gone to see the movie A Beautiful Mind. And finally, after all these years, he now understood how someone could actually see something that wasn't really there, that someone could hear voices that didn't exist outside the confines of their own mind. And that someone could actually believe these things, these delusions were real. Now, he confessed to me, he finally understood how someone might feel helpless and fearful and confused and how someone could struggle to cope in the world while their own delusional thoughts intermingled with reality. And as he told me this, my blood began to boil. My first instinct was to strike this man in the throat hard, crushing his windpipe, breaking his Adam's apple. I wanted to gut punch him stomp his nuts into the ground. I wanted to scream in his face, you stupid asshole. You allowed your own denial and judgment to estrange you from your daughter when she needed you most. You didn't believe her when she told you what she was going through. You didn't believe your own daughter. You didn't believe her doctors when they tried to explain it. But now, now you believe it when Ron fucking Howard tells you? <laughs> but I didn't say those things. I kept my counselor cool, running on high, because no matter the source of his uh, epiphanistic realizations, I was relieved that he finally saw the light. He finally understood what no one else could make him understand, including myself. And damn it, if it wasn't Ron Howard and Russell Crowe that broke through. Movies are supposed to transport us, take us places we've never been, as the good doctor said, buy the ticket, take the ride. But movies are also supposed to teach us, to make us think, and perhaps more importantly, make us feel. And this week, as I recounted his movies researching our topic, I realized that the movies of Ron Howard do exactly that and even more. I mean, after all, he made me fall in love with a mermaid. He made me feel the claustrophobic vastness of, and fear of outer space long before Sandra Bullock took on zero Gs in her bikini briefs. And <laughs> I'll admit, he even coaxed a fairly amazing performance out of Russell Crowe as the schizophrenic mathematics professor John Nash in A Beautiful Mind. Departing from the narrative of the book, Ron Howard uses the language of cinema to cleverly capture Nash's struggle with his mental illness, making us feel the fear and confusion of delusional thoughts, hallucinations, and paranoia. And more importantly, Howard uses his creative pulpit to educate us by showing us what otherwise cannot be seen. He helps us understand something that truly cannot be explained. He takes us for that ride and helps us to feel what John Nash feels. And what tens of thousands of people who suffer from mental illness feel every day. So if the upshot of it all is if a beautiful mind helped only one person on this planet understand, and I mean, really get what mental illness feels like, then it is a great film. And if this movie opened just one man's eyes and heart to his own daughter's daily struggle, <clears throat> it may very well be one of the best films ever made. So maybe Ron Howard isn't bad, uh, isn't so bad after all. I mean, what the hell's my problem with him? Arrested Development was a lot of fun. He, he introduced us to Michael Keaton. He provides us with a steady drip dose of Clint Howard. And where would we be without Clint Howard? Help. <laughs> Max and I partied with Clint Howard in a llama while getting sideways on white wine spritzers, strange vibrations at an after hours mixer one summer night at the LA Zoo. Ron Howard, Ron Howard even made a great film with Vince Vaughn and Kevin James. And no one makes a great film with Vince Vaughn and Kevin James. No. And while I'm still no fan, I'm sorry, Russell Crowe, for being such an asshole to you. I, I guess you're not so bad. Thank you for giving yourself over to this movie and this part and becoming John Nash without a question, the most significant role of your career. I know for a fact it changed someone's life and I can only hope it had a similar effect on many, many others. And if it helped allay the mystery and stigma of mental illness, even just a little bit, then for that alone, Mr. Howard and Mr. Crow, you both have all my respect. Just don't expect me to see Noah. Oh, no. That, 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 very good, Adam. Honestly, nice. Welcome, yeah, Adam. And he pops his cherry. 
Yes. Kim, you are now officially. <laughs> oh, uh, it felt good. That's a, there's no getting out of this room and now, Adam. It you've felt crossed good. the point of no return. That was really, really good. Really good job, man. Oh, well, thank God. you. You're no, you're you're welcome, uh, dude. First of all, what's your what's your problem with Russell Crowe? I think I'm just jealous. Yeah, really. Well, listen, Ciccolini said it at length. That I know. Well, you know, you prick, right? He's kind yeah, of a prick. yeah. You just said, well, you know, Ron Howard directing and Russell Crowe acting, doing this movie. If it changed one person's uh, uh, view on this disease, then uh, it's you know it's worth it, right? But there's one thing that's that's uh, for certain, according to, to Ciccolini, is that, yeah, Russell Crowe, yeah, he still continues to be an asshole. Yeah, that guy's a prick. Yeah, so it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't change anything, you know, with <laughs> Crowe. I never really thought about uh, Russell Crowe that deeply. I know he, you know, listen, he's in uh, some, some big movies. A couple of them have won Best Picture, like Gladiator and... Uh, uh, what you call this one? A Beautiful Mind. Uh, I do like American Gangster. I'm a sucker for that movie. Uh, but one performance, Adam, that I really, really like a lot uh, yeah. from Crow is r- right before he hit, like you know, before he got really popular, and that's in L.A. Confidential. He oh plays, yeah, that was yeah. A, yeah he great. plays Bud White, and that Bud White character is really well done. He does a really really great strong quiet job portraying that uh police officer in that movie and uh i've always really dug that character but uh i'm not a fan i am not a fan of gladiator at all and what the fuck is up with noah i saw <laughs> i saw a trailer for this what not looks sure like on this one. what looks like a giant piece of shit that darren aronofsky's directing yeah, that's a that's the surprise there. That's that is the surprise there. What the fuck is that all about? Nah. Oh, it's gonna be good then if it's if Aronofsky's doing it. It's, it'll no, be no guarantee of that. And you know what? It'll if be... there's anything that we can learn from what Ciccolini was just saying when he says, "What does he say, Max? Too many chiefs." You know? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, if Aronofsky's like taking on this huge, huge project where he's now gonna have to deal. Big time with the studio because now there's even more money involved in his films, and he's also having to deal with Russell Crowe. I mean, Joe, it could be a disaster. Uh, I don't know. I listen. Um, Aronofsky made a bad. A, you, I actually kind of liked it, but he made a he made sort of a flop in the Fountain, but he did it in a way that was highly personal. That's his I, own movie, though. Nobody. I. That's what I mean. I can't see him. This guy going to making a film and just and and laying over for a studio, like I think he must have some. He, I I have too much respect for the guy. I personally, do too. Maybe. I have a lot of respect for him too. But uh, I guess time will tell. Yeah, time. Listen, we, are animals in the Noah movie? Is this about yes, Noah's Ark? It's about Noah's Ark. Well, I haven't seen anything about. Do the animals, animals talk? I did not see any talk. I would see it if the animals talk. I, I no, I don't think the animals talk. I like hold on animal movies. Take take a break, Adam. You need to fix your mic again so you're more clear. You were sounding great during your review. And How's you got that? A Am off. I back in business? Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Resume. Thank you. But uh, no, Adam. No talking animals. That's uh, I usually see most talking animal films. Now, are you a fan of Babe? That's one of my all-time, if not my all-time, favorite films. So you are not like, even—you're not even joking around. Like you love talking animal movies. Well, listen, across the board, no, I'm joking a little bit. <laughs> babe, you happen to mention he's a babe one. junkie. That's you happen crazy. to mention the one movie that, uh, to me, goes far beyond a talking animal film. I think Babe is one of, if not the most perfect films. It is a perfect film in my mind. Okay. I just think across the board, any way you want to look at that movie, that's a perfect. Yo, I heard. Uh, I've always heard great things about Babe. I've never seen. I've never seen it. But what are your feelings about Babe Two: Pig in the City? <laughs> Max and I saw that movie together. That's amazing. <laughs> saw that movie together, and uh, I can picture that. That's very sweet. You, you two sharing a bucket of popcorn, think, watching Babe. <laughs> I think we did. I think we saw that at a mall movie theater when that came out, and we're really disappointed, except for most things featuring Mickey Rooney in that film. God. Including like a I slow motion to pie in the thing. <laughs> it was like someone upset a fruit cart or or like a pie went flying into Mickey Rooney's face. 
<laughs> and just the slow motion, like a 107 year old Mickey Rooney on his hands and knees with a monkey with getting a pie in his face is kind of worth the price of admission. Does anybody uh, listen? I know that the schizophrenia thing, I know it's a horrible disease. And I listen, I, I couldn't possibly imagine what to, I, to even be associated with someone that has suffered from it or even have it myself. And I really hope I don't sound like a douchebag by saying this. Does, does, can anybody agree with me that it it might not, like where they think that it might actually be kind of cool to have these imaginary people? <laughs> well, the, you know what? That's a, Tom. I know you're doing being funny there. In yeah, a, no, but in a, in a, way, yeah, in a way. I, well, well, but this is the this is the I kind of take exception. Look what, what Adam, you, what you were saying about how it affected someone. If it, you know, the result is actually what's important, not actually how they got there. I guess, but uh, the issue that I have with this film is exactly how they portray this man this terrible disease and it's sort of it's kind of funny it's it's he he portrays this like almost the same way that he portrays the prostitutes in night shift like it's like the uh it's like the middle class safe version of schizophrenia mm -hmm. in a in a way even though it's it's terribly it's it's debilitating and all that stuff and right. it, it's emotional and everything right. but you know he's gonna be everything's gonna be fine He's going to get the Nobel Award. It's going to work out perfectly for him. Sure, he'll and he, everything. He'll have a beautiful wife that right. sticks by him and helps him through. Yeah, it, but yeah. even knowing, and you know, it's knowing, not these yeah. tormenting. It's not these tormenting voices right. that are, you know, jabbing at his brain. It's you know, it's these like you know these film genre cliches that are yeah. you know populating him like as if he's in freaking The Wizard of Oz or something That's like true, that. Joe. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And oh. and it just it. Look, I when I saw this film, Tom, I liked it because I was like really into films that you know happen like on on this other level, like it happens on like the psychodrama sort of level, and I was really into. I I really appreciated that at the time that I saw it, but this time seeing it, I and especially knowing what it was, that really just bugged the hell out of me, and it just made me think of like so many other better films of about. Uh, madness, and I'm not even saying like documentary, real lifestyle madness, but films that make you feel like the guy's going out of his fucking mind. Yeah, like you know, we just I, mentioned Aronofsky, like Pie, is, yeah, and Black and Black Swan, Black Swan, Black Swan is another, another great, great one. example. But uh, Joe, on a beautiful mind, though, uh, I I think I know what Howard was trying to do in his approach with having those three characters in the film and leading, like try to like manipulating the viewer into you know, thinking that sure. they might be real. And I, right. I get all that, and it's it's fine, and it is safe. But to me, the the best scene in this movie is when you know that those people aren't there, and he's, like, you know, flipping out, like, going towards his wife, thinking that, and the baby, yeah. thinking that there yeah. is someone there. And you you know he can't you're just witnessing himself. his insanity and it would have been a better movie if, if i think if they if howard took that approach where you're just watching this nut like you, you well here well here's another example of a great film that does that but doesn't really let you out of it and doesn't and you're and you're terrified because you you know it's not going to work out well she's not gonna, this person's not going to get the freaking nobel prize in the end is it like a film like uh, repulsion polanski's uh yeah. polanski's film repulsion you ever see that i mean it's fucking met or um and i just i i do i wrote down a few of these uh i wrote down uh bug bug oh, is that freaking great brilliant great film Brilliant. And uh, this other one, and this is this is a I, I may do a, a show on this. Clean Shaven is another fucking one. I, it's a I'm bit, looking right at Clean Shaven, Joe. Yeah, it's crazy, you know, isn't the, it? Uh, the actor, and I'm blanking on his name. He's working all the time now. Who is in Bug? Um, Michael Shannon. He is in another film, and I can't remember the name of it. Oh, uh, that's right. Take, take, take shelter. shelter. That's the one. Yeah. That's that is a great film. Oh my God. That's a great film about insanity. And see, and this is the issue. And then when I went to do some research on this. This guy didn't see any fucking uh, delusions. People don't see – most people don't see this stuff. It's voices that, you know, they're, they're coming out of like some dark area, you know. So I I just had an issue with it, man. And I, I love – and look, this is – and I will say that I really did like this film the first time I saw it, you know. Right. But, but the, that stuff just did not sit well with me this time around. Hold on. Let me get uh, – because you brought up Clean Shaven. It's, I have not seen Clean Shaven. But I so am once now I... really interested in seeing it because I just discovered that Peter Green is the star of Clean Shaven. He plays yeah. the, he plays the, the schizophrenic. 
Yeah, he peels his friggin'. Th- see, the one scene, Max. Did you see it, Max? Yes. Did you the one scene like the the one scene in that film, that low budget film, almost is better than the entire film, Beautiful Mind. And I know I'm gonna get chipped. No, no, no. But no. he sits in a car and he peels his friggin'. What does he do? He he peels his fucking fingernails off, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like that's madness. That's a madness that this it's, guy. It's it's so devastating that I just I think people just need to see it. Yeah, oh, we should do a we should do an insane. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Show about insanity. You know? That's yeah. That would totally work for us, man. I do uh, <laughs> uh, want to get Max uh, uh, experience on revisiting a beautiful mind. Uh, Max, real quick, let me uh, let, let me in on your thoughts on your uh, recent screening of this film. I didn't recently screen this film. There's no way I will ever see this movie again after I saw it the first time. Wow. I will not revisit this film. I have never, I, speaking as someone who might be potentially mentally ill, I will never sit through this movie again. First off, uh, I don't do math. Second off, I sat through this thing with my wife, and I got up ten times. I was so bored out of my mind. <laughs> Melancholia. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Son- yeah, Melancholy. Psycho. Shine. Twelve Monkeys. I mean... Taxi Driver. Anyone. Taxi Driver. <clears throat> and... and, and, and Gide, I, Wrath of the Gods. Fitzcarraldo. I, thank you. I have never identified less, less with a movie about crazy people than this film. Wow. I, I just... It's, 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 it's out of my... I can't do it. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to let the show down. No, no. It's and your I know feelings. I might, Pain. But but here's the real thing. Can we just acknowledge Adam's introduction? Because I thought it was fucking extraordinary. It was really and, good. And why? Why did you choose this topic? And it's great that you <laughs> chose it. I just want to know why. No, Tom. Oh, wait, before wait, hold on one second, Mac. I do want to say, Adam, I'm uh, I'm fl- well as one of the producers, the co-producers or whatever of the show. I'm f- flattered that you uh, took such a serious approach to this yeah like it, like i'm i'm honored that you took that that tact and the way that and what you put into that review honestly you you understood the spirit you you took the time to understand the spirit of the show and it's i it's a i'm just humbled yeah by it's what a hard you, so yeah it's, that's great it's a hard the hard thing to get and uh i agree with joe you you get it well, thanks, like you guys. get I appreciate it. it it was that fun was awesome. it was fun glad to contribute and yeah. uh and yeah you know it's interesting, this particular film, uh, all these other films we're talking about, I think, are so much better, uh, such better films. Mm. They're, despite the, uh, like, what you pointed out, Joe, which is absolutely right, the kinds of delusions this guy is having are pretty ridiculous. Um, like, they're all the same delusion. Like, like that doesn't happen, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's not the same character. It's not a play. It's not a high school play. You know, some kid's in a costume and he comes out every, you know... Yeah, people's delusions minutes. usually don't have three-act structures. <laughs> right, 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 right. And yeah. you're saying that they normally don't have... Re- there's not a recurring, uh, I guess, character in, in the delusion? There can be sometimes. There, there can. can be, yeah. Yeah, uh, and it is, you're right, There's it's, visual hallucinations are much less common than auditory, but... I got to say, as as much as I really don't like Russell Crowe, he captured some idiosyncrasies. I know he had time with the actual person, and it was one another opportunity to just sort of mimic somebody. But he did capture some uh, good idiosyncrasies, and I thought portrayed sort of the fear and the confusion really, really well. Maybe more realistic than some of these other films that are better films, uh, but as with- good as it gets, Spider, right. Pink Floyd, The Wall, Francis, Mulholland Drive, Apocalypse Now, Apocalypse Now, Apocalypse. yep. The the machinist, psycho, yeah, psycho, <laughs> every one of them, psycho two, and, and you know what, and and those aren't more realistic depictions, but you know what, they it captures more realistically is to me. Oh look, I'm not crazy, but it feels like an actual madness. It feels like yeah, those. well, it's like this fueled madness, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. for Ron Howard, he's not crazy; he's but, stable. Dude, this this won Not best. Here, listen, I, I, I'm hearing your anger. This movie won best picture. Ridiculous. Yeah, and Nebraska didn't, and Bruce yep. Dern didn't, and June it, Squibb didn't, and David Lynch didn't. That's David right. Lynch. Didn't. David Lynch. Well, David Lynch's right. Mulholland Drive, a film about, I guess, who knows what. The fuck yeah, I, I, all and, that. And, I mean, it's about madness right. in and, some and, way. And 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 Chick Chickalini's Dances with Wolves. I had to mute my microphone. <laughs> that beat. Good fellas. People love that movie, Max. 
Yeah, he, they do. I, people love Dances with Wolves. I think Dances with Wolves is one of the most boring two hours I've ever it spent. It has its time. moments. And, and it's a very mystical film. Tom. I yeah, but I'm not in. I can't. But get Tom, you evaded the question, and I want you to say because I think it's great. Because look what you've created just by bringing up Ron Howard. We're all respectful of Ron Howard. We're not bashing the fucking guy. I we all have our different POVs, and it's very interesting. Maybe just sure. to us. But why did you choose Ron <laughs> Howard, and why did you assign yeah. the counselor a beautiful mind? Okay, uh, all good questions. And Max, first of all, let me just say this. You're absolutely right. Uh, Even, uh, you know, what we've gotten out of Ron Howard, I mean, just talking about Michael Keaton, talking about Clint Howard, you know, talking about this subject, prostitution, whatever. I mean, we've really found a lot of things, which which is awesome. The reason why I picked Ron Howard, now I have no love affair with, with the man or his movies. You know, I, I'm basically with you guys on pretty much everything that you've all said tonight, uh, for, for the most part. What happened was, was my mother, who is friends with Ciccolini, you know, said, you know, well, you know, I have a friend. He, he works with Ron Howard. Uh, uh, he, uh, he'd, probably, he'd probably be good on your show if you wanted to have him as a guest. And I, I said, you know, Mom, I'm like, you know, that's nice. And it's my mom making a suggestion. I'm like, that's very nice. I said, maybe I could revolve a show around the guest and do the Ron Howard thing because he had worked with Ron Howard multiple times. So I just, so you're also using your brain, Tom. Tom. Yeah. Tom, do you think you have any degree of mental illness? I don't know. That's a good question. How would I be, know that? I mean, I mean, Adam, do you think Tom has any degree of mental illness? I can't weigh in on that. I don't know Tom very well. Yeah, that's I've, not fair. So do you think you're crazy? Well, do I think I'm crazy? <laughs> I have issues for sure. I think Selling, everybody has it. Birdie. <laughs> Dead ringers. Yep, birdie. Now, here's the thing though. Zelig is probably that that's oh god, I love that movie. Okay. Adam. Do you think you're a sociopath? Do I think I am a sociopath? Yeah. No, but I do believe I could be a cult leader. <laughs> and Max, you think you could be one too. Yes. That's the Leo in us, I think. Yeah, but it's different than Adam's cult. His cult would be much more organized, believe me. It would be much more organized. It would be. It would be a well-run cult, I guarantee it. Would be a, mine would be a fucking disaster. Although that would end up with me myself. Yeah, it might be a little more fun, though, and that would be a much more exciting ending. <laughs> if my cult, which my cult would end, I would just get bored and end up just leaving. But, uh, yeah, yours would end by having a ritualistic self-eating party. Do you have, like, minions? Like, Max has minions. I mean, you go on to, uh, you know, the internet. You go on the social networks. You go on to, you go on to your, you, you know, your, your bowler hat channel, what, whatever. I mean, Max, I mean, these people, you know, they, you know, some of them are really in, into Max. Adam, do you, do you have, I mean, do you have minions? Well, not, not in the social media world because I, I don't do too much. You don't uh, do it. But in, li- in, in life, yeah. Uh, in life, I've got... I've got what I, I the minions that I gather I put to work for me basically, mm-hmm. so one way or another they're working for me, uh, and so it's kind of like I'm running a cult <laughs> in a sense. You know, it is. I can like buy that. it. Yeah, I can buy it because I I'll tell you this. I mean, I, I've been doing this thing with with Max now for for a couple of years now, and I like listen. Before I had Max on, I was a huge fan of his work. I loved him. Really? I st- I loved him. <laughs> I love him. I Past don't. tense. I still love him, but he has that. Like you're drawn, you're drawn to Max, and he draws you in, and you you want to be a part of his world. And the interesting thing is, Adam, is that uh, you do have that same capability because when uh, we had you on the second time, I was like, man, I, I told uh, Max, I'm like, I think I'm falling in love with Adam. I'm like, oh my guy- god, I had to listen to so much Adam. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's awesome. <laughs> Well, like, now we can actually let Max know that since Adam's so good on the show, Max, we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> I get to watch horror movies again. <laughs> We've got your Back to horror your movie. Pal, sorry. Ain't going anywhere. That's fine, Joe. Guys, it has been so fun. I, so <laughs> much. Ready to go. And I wish you all the very, very best. You guys are so cool. Hey, tell you what, down the road, bring me in. I have no problem. I'll be a little, uh, you know, I'll be a, a, a Ash Hamilton. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Joe, you realize how much this is hurting my feelings right now? What? What? Oh, oh Max. That you, oh, I just heard Max. Even, even though it's everybody acting out, I hope 
It's, <laughs> this, this is not how I want this show to end. <laughs> At all. Is hearing Max, like end for Even if Max end. is joking around saying those words, I don't want to hear it. Oh, Tommy. <laughs> I'm just well, fucking there's... out there. I know, man. I know. But I, like... so I'm fucking around too. But listen, I can't listen to that kind of shit, Joe. Please, don't do that again. No, hey, triggers, Adam. Triggers. Yes. <laughs> How do you think I'm doing with my craziness? And be honest. I, I think you're doing quite well, actually. Thank overall, you. you found you found a good way to work with it and work through things that needed to get worked through. Well done. Yes. I used to yell at Adam very violently. Adam, can you elaborate at all on that? The uh, schizophrenic woman who was in the uh, you said she did the uh, she went and did some porn and, and everything. What, what what's up with this girl? Well, unfortunately, that story does not have a happy ending. Oh boy. She ended up taking a boyfriend's uh, gun and, and putting her brains oh. out the side of her skull a few years after I had stopped working with her. So that, that wasn't a happy ending. And that's oh. often more how things end other than the John Nash, Ron Howard happy endings. All right. Right. Some schizophrenics get applauded by thousands and win the, po- the, Nobel, <laughs> some Prize. the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Most. And some just get a bullet in their yeah. brain. Although there are many, many, many people that suffer schizophrenia who are able to actually uh, live good lives. But there have to be so many factors in place. It's kind of like you really have to be lucky if you're going to make it with schizophrenia. You have to have good doctors, good medication. It, you, know, you can't be too sick with it because you have to be rational enough to take meds and be able to live independently. Uh, and there's a number of people that, that absolutely do every day that drive cars and have jobs and, go to school and are in relationships that have schizophrenia and it's managed. Do you uh, think, yeah, I mean, don't, do, you, know. do you find that these, uh, like the medication, I mean, do you, do you find that it works for the most part? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's no, there's no one medicine that helps the same way for anyone. Everyone is an individual and mm-hmm. psychiatry is really just an educated guessing game as to what kind of meds and experimenting, you know, just, uh, experimental, just, Try a little bit of this with this one, and we'll see how so it goes. True. And then let's yeah. let's a little more oh. of this and a little less of that, and let's fold this one into the mix. So, you know, you're not going to get that with a doctor that uh, Medicare covers. So, you know, uh, that kind of attention from a doctor requires that, uh, like like anything in this healthcare system, if you have money, you're going to have access to better treatment. You have a better chance of of living well. But talking about experimentation, that electroshock therapy shit is. Insane. Like, I can't even believe that people did that often. Hey, a little dab will they, do you. Well, you know, they do it more often they, now. Uh, I can't believe. I thought that they stopped that. No, it just. But it, our image of it is still very much like the cuckoo's nest and uh, right. beautiful mind of. Right, right. Like real barbaric. Yeah. Not that way anymore. And it actually can be successful. Although they're finding that it's more successful for people with chronic depression than even uh, delusional disorders and psychotic disorders. How could, but how could, uh, I mean, how does, how could that help? Well, here's the, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but the, the, I was just doing a little bit of reading on it and they don't even know how it helps. Like it's a, it's almost a mystery yeah, on how it nuts. actually works. It kind of is. It's just, uh, it just kind of inducing a seizure somehow sort of realigns some things and shakes things loose. <laughs> they just, you know, they're, I, I know that there's science behind it, but I don't know the details on it. But uh, again, doesn't work for everyone. Uh, works for some people. I wish we could like zap each other with electricity, like while, like while we're doing the show. <laughs> you mean like in Jackass the movie? <laughs> yeah, like in Jackass. Oh, I was watching Jackass 3D last night, and I watched the uh, Electric Avenue scene. <laughs> Electric Avenue nice. is awesome. It's nice. totally awesome. And Margera, it's so funny. What the best thing about that is before they go through it, just Margera does not want to come. No, and nope. he's, he is struggling more than anyone else to get. And he's like in the front. He's got to get going. A jackass won an Oscar last night. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking about that because I tweeted. Bad Grandpa was nominated for. Uh, for best makeup design, I think. Right. Yeah. It was nominated for an Oscar, and I tweeted, uh, that's the closest the uh, the Jackass boys will ever get to uh, winning an oh, Oscar. Oh, I didn't see that, or I would have retweeted it. I and then fucking Twitter. I retweeted it. <laughs> retweeted it. 
But yeah, Spike Jones winds up winning. Uh, what, what did he win? Best original screen. Best original screenplay for her, which I thought he absolutely deserved. Out of those, uh, as good as those films were, his script was the best script. Well, I haven't seen her, and I really am looking forward to seeing it, dude. I Great mean, stuff. yeah, I just Joaquin Phoenix's mustache alone makes me want to. He's so good. He's yeah, so... he is awesome. Uh, guys, listen, I want to thank everyone for talking, Ron Howard. Uh, last week and this week, we had a lot of fun. I'd like to also thank our guest, Anthony Chick Chickalini. Max, can you do Chick for us one last time? I just want to say it was really great to be on the show. You know, I don't really do a lot of shows. People don't really ask me a lot of questions, but it's so funny about people when they have questions because usually, you know, they want to know one thing or they want to know another thing, and sometimes you don't have the answer to the question, and sometimes you kind of have to make it up as you go along. Now, Chick, we only have a half an hour left. Could you just tell us what um, your favorite song is? Just just keep in mind, we only have a half hour. 30 minutes, Chick. Go. My favorite song, oh, jeez, oh, Finoli. I mean, my favorite song, I mean, it's like asking who your favorite kid is. I mean, that's just such a hard question to ask, uh, chicken face. Uh, no, my favorite song, my favorite song. Well, the, the, I don't know, there's so many songs. I mean, which genre are we talking about? My favorite uh, jazz song? Are we talking about my favorite rock song? Are we talking about my favorite show tune? Are we talking about my favorite uh, uh, standard? Are we talking about my favorite uh, alternative? Well, I don't really listen to alternative very much, but you know, songs are just, you know, very subjective. There's a lot of songs. You could and, talk all day about them, right? It's something you could I talk could talk about. <laughs> mm-hmm. I could talk all day about them. I, mean, you I haven't would have even to gotten say... started. You haven't even gotten started and it's been five minutes. <laughs> you know, I, I'd have to say Tuesday afternoon by them Moody Blues. <laughs> Now, <laughs> very good. Very succinct. Now, Chick, does right. your wife think that you you talk too much? It's so funny that you mentioned that uh, uh, cutting room guy because uh, my wife says, you know, you're always talking, you're always saying stuff, you know, you're very verbose, you know, you always have a lot of stories, you know, you're always talking, and, uh, you know, I just, hey, I'm just, uh, I'm a guy that has a, you know, a life, and, you know, a, a life is, is a reflection, and um, it's a reflection in words, and words come out of mouths, and there's a lot of wet mouths talking about their lives, and oftentimes than not, you'd be amazed, I just lost my own train of thought. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to thank uh, Joe Christiana, Max Cook, the counselor, Adam Shoulder. Welcome aboard. I'd also like to thank our guest tonight. Now the show's getting interesting and we have to go. <laughs> <laughs> done. I am done. The Cutting Room Movie Podcast is brought to you. It's getting interesting, Joe, he says, because he can start going off now. <laughs> Because Max now has the floor. The show is starting to get interesting. The Cutting Room Movie Podcast is brought to you by Christiana Productions and New Media Limited. The show is edited. Huh? Go- the show you is know, in- New Media Limited. They're, they're great. I've done a lot of work for them and they're, they're wonderful people. The show is edited and co-produced by Joseph Schreck and produced by Thomas Detloff and Joe Christiana. You can follow us on Facebook at The Cutting Room movie podcast follow me facebook. on twitter I don't love facebook but I'll you, I I and DC. Do, do, you pre- do you prefer facebook or twitter you can we, also we only check have out seven hours twitter and no more <laughs> christiana productions.com max and adams <laughs> max please don't stop max get up here max, <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with this? this? Is the host of the show? <laughs> Max um, and Adam, please, not to the, the head production. No, no, how would you sound that at this episode? In their changed. Mimosa podcast show, no, Max it. Basically, what you have to do is take a while. <laughs> then you have to sort of break the like file. Do you, do you do the... What? You can see the file on the screen. It's a bunch it's of lies. Music and from the num- cutting room is done by the Check that out at www.thefire.com. It's a living search for the Interesting. Is this interesting? Is this interesting? And then you have to cut the, the clicks and the clacks out, right? <laughs> See, a lot of these guys come in with the dentures. They do a click DVD and click release click review click. of the And I know, I know that Green Apple is good. Not <laughs> Apple. <laughs> because Apple that Maniac way. Part 1. Now, now, which, which kind of software do you prefer? Until then. Well, who can choose the software? This, this we software. are over. 
and we so, are out. Ciao. Go. <laughs> Office Max, Office Depot, Staples, Amazon. There's so many options as to where you can purchase this. more of your strange desires the cutting room movie podcast we do chicken right